and God is good. Amen. Amen. We're looking a little few today, so we're going to have to sing loud, right? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's see. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so we have two announcements, three actually. Um, the church directory is in the back for the form to fill out, and I think you all have done that, Yes. but there's other people that are going to be here later today, so I'll remind them after service, so we'll goodbye past that one. Um, May 4th is National <laughs> Day of Prayer. Remember, pray for the nation, pray for your local families around you and your neighborhood, pray for your city, pray, <coughs> amen. God says what? That the righteous man's prayer availeth much. Amen? So we're praying that God just touch our city, touch our country, and whatever the Lord lays upon your heart to pray. Amen? Amen. And in that time, we're going to be fasting between 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. You just drink lots of liquids, whether it's coffee, water, juice. I suggest juice and water. Um, coffee it acts like a dehydrant, so you want to Try to get some water in there between your coffee. I know I drink coffee all day, so I know I'm going to be drinking water and juice. Amen? Um, so, fasting and prayer, 11 to 1, on May 4th, National Day of Prayer. The Shiloh Handmaidens is this Saturday, March 18th at 1215. There's a meeting, okay? So have that um, fellowship. Amen? Um, I was going to make an announcement for the men's fellowship, but there's two of us, three of us here. Um, I'm working on having a men's fellowship where we are going to come here and we're going to eat and we're going to have a time of fellowship. I'll give you the date as soon as the Lord puts it on my heart when we do that, okay? It's coming about. I've been asked about it a couple times, so the Lord is putting a schedule for me on a Wednesday, and we'll meet on a Wednesday, and I'll tell you what date that is and what time it will be, okay? So keep that in prayer, men. Um, we have a short meeting with Joy after the service today for anyone who would like to be involved in any way in the children's ministry. As you know, our family is growing. We have children coming into the fellowship now. So we're going to set up a, a children's ministry downstairs while the service is going on. If you want to volunteer to be a part of the ministry in any form, let my wife know and we'll get you the clearances and we'll lay hands on you. We'll have the body of Christ lay hands on you and we'll anoint you for that ministry. Amen. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Um, we have church spring cleaning come up. You want a part of the, be a part of the church, be a part of the ministry, come and allow God to use you and help clean in our church. Amen. And how's Pastor Ed say? Many hands make less work, light work. I like that. I, I try to remember that. When I need help, I'm like, oh, man, I need a lot of help. <laughs> If there's a lot of us, it's it's done within an hour and a half. There's not a lot that we need to do. We need, what we do upstairs is we clean, wash the walls down the paneling, and we run the sweeper up here and dust what we can. And um, downstairs, we clean the bathrooms and clean the kitchen area. And you run the sweeper, and you're good to go. So it's not that much. If we put all our hands in, it's done really quick. Okay? What's the Spring day? cleaning coming up. When? I'm giving you... I'm giving you a two weeks notice. Okay. <laughs> Within two weeks, I'll set the day. I have to set the day according to when I can because a lot goes on at work. I don't know when I can get out on time. So, and babysitting went on. So I will let you know, I'll give you two weeks heads up. Okay? okay? It's coming soon. All right. We supply all the cleaning stuff. You just have to bring your muscles. All right. And your joyful spirit. <laughs> Amen? Amen? All right. Uh, the church directory, as I said, if you don't, if you know someone that hasn't filled it out, pass them along, they're on the table, okay? Remind them to fill it out for us. Um, let me see. Okay, now the prayer request. Marsha O'Hare, she's home resting, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> she had surgery. Uh, uh, no, blood. She, she did not have the surgery. Oh. Okay, so tell us what you know. That's it. She's home. They have not made a decision on surgery yet. Oh, okay. She's home um, under doctor's care for rest. All right. Praise the Lord. Say, yeah. 
Pat Uhouse is not feeling well today. She, uh, doctor gave her antibiotics for a respiratory infection, so praise the Lord, she's home resting and getting fixed up, amen. Her husband Rick has had knee surgery, and he's now at where I work, at the health center, he's getting therapy, so keep him in prayer. He's asked for your prayer, amen. Kathy Schrader has blood clots in her legs, and she's uh, required for a colonoscopy test. That just came up yesterday. She got a test result that showed something, so they need to do a colonoscopy. Okay. Shirley Barnhart, keep her in prayer. She has cancer. She was um, at the hospital. She wasn't expected to make it in the next couple of days, so she's now home resting. Praise the Lord. Shirley Patterson, Patterson, please keep her in prayer. She's battling cancer. She's at home as well. Amen? Crystal. Amen. Crystal Orgabon is um, battling cancer. She's also at home as well. Anyone else? Prayer request. Mom, do you remember my niece, Becky? Yes. She passed away. Aww. February 27, she had a heart attack. But anyway, I give praise because I know she's with Jesus. Amen. Now. Right. So keep the family in prayer. Amen. Yeah. Oh, I remember the other um, announcement. Bill had vertigo, came back. Okay. Keep Bill in prayer. That's Ethel's husband, suffering from vertigo. I just want to give a praise for Mary, my friend Mary, we've been praying for. Yeah. Uh, they increased her dementia medicine, and she's not suspicious and paranoid, paranoid anymore. Praise but the they're Lord. still doing more tests to okay. see Good. how far she is. Praise the Lord. Yeah. I remember there's one more announcement. If you ordered a CD, they're back at the table. Remember, it's a $3 donation. Put it in the church box for the CD that you ordered, okay? They're, I did them this morning. They're ready for you to go. Okay, so that's it for the announcements, the prayer request, amen? I so. have one more. Oh, yeah. Um, our neighbor across the street from us, we the OD. Okay. Saturday morning, he OD'd, and he's in uh, Allegheny General, and his girlfriend told me he has a bad liver. He's not doing too good. Okay. So pray for his salvation. What's his first name? Bob. Good. All right. Well, let's pray. Father God, we ask Lord Jesus that you hear our heart today. We ask God that you know these people that are within our heart, that you would touch them, Father God, through the blood of Christ. Lord, you said it in your word that if we ask for leaving anything in your name according to your will, it shall be done. So Lord, we ask, Lord, you touch each person's life that is mentioned on the prayer list. Those that we may be thinking of during the service, Lord, add them to that list. Touching them, Father God, delivering them, providing for them, whatever the need may be, Father. Salvation, healing, financial blessings, whatever it is, Father. Touch these people in the name of Jesus, we ask. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right, now we'll have the worship team come up. But I thank God every day for heat when it's cold and air conditioning when it's hot. 
Amen. 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 God's still good. He's still on the throne. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he's able. He's <coughs> able. I know he is able. I know my God is able to carry me through. He's able.
Yeah. 
name is Jesus. Somebody say it. Jesus. His name is Jesus. Blessed be the Jesus. name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. At this time, we're continuing in our love gift unto God. We gave up our worship and song, and now we'll give up our tithes and offerings unto the Lord. Amen. Bring it as you have it and give it with a cheerful heart as you're giving it unto the Lord. Amen. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And Jesus is the way, Jesus is the way that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. You serve a God of possibilities. 
Who else can split this guy open and come riding out on a horse? <laughs> Amen? No one but the God of possibilities. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38, we can read where a young girl, a virgin, becomes pregnant and gives birth to the Son of God. You serve a God of possibilities. Who else can cause a virgin to become pregnant without the involvement of man and have his only begotten birth from a mortal woman? No one but the God of possibilities. Somebody say amen. amen. And should you read John chapter 11, verse 1 through 44, you will see where a man died, no heartbeat, no pulse, dead for three days and was raised from the grave, very much alive. Who else can raise a dead man from the grave? No one but the God of possibilities. Amen. So let me ask you this morning, what are you calling impossible in your life right now? Maybe a sickness that seems impossible to heal. Maybe a financial difficulty that seems impossible to be met. Maybe a broken relationship that seems irreparable. Listen, what are you calling impossible? That thing that you call impossible, your God is calling possible. Amen? Amen. Say it with me. All things, All things are, possible are possible with God. With God. Do you believe this to be true? Yes. yes. If you believe this to be true, then why are you saying you have an impossible thing in your life right now? Hmm? If you believe this to truly be true, that there is no prayer that cannot be answered. Amen? Amen. If you truly believe it to be true, there's no prayer that cannot truly be answered. What is it that you're asking of God? My Bible says in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? I want us to look at those four words. If you can believe. Mm -hmm. Amen? I know that there was a gentleman in the Bible that was building a campfire and he reached down to stir the sticks to cause the flame to build up and the viperous snake latched onto his hand. Mm -hmm. And without a thought, he shook the thing away. And the people around him were in amazement. Well, you were just bitten by a snake. Didn't you realize what that was? That's a viper snake. We saw this. But what? He just shook it off without a thought. Mm -hmm. If you can believe, all things are possible. When there was a little girl, Tabitha, she was in a house, and she was dying. In all appearances, in all the facets of what death looks like, this little Tabitha was dead. And Jesus came on the scene. Somebody say, Jesus came on the scene. Jesus, Jesus came on the scene. And when he came upon the scene, they gathered around and said, Jesus, please, my little girl, she's dying. Please do something. He immediately said, everybody leave the room. Why do you suppose he asked everyone to leave the room? Because some have a hard time believing. Amen. So he got the naysayers, those that said, oh, it's impossible, out of the way. Huh? If you can believe, all things are possible. Jesus spoke life into that little girl, and she Amen. raised from the dead. Amen. If you can believe, all things are possible. Jesus called her by name, Tabitha. Mm -hmm. Arise. Jesus is calling you by name this morning. D, arise. John, arise. Ethel, arise. Mm -hmm. Susan, arise. Donna, arise. Art, arise. Joy, arise. Tony, arise. Ed, arise. Janet, arise. Bob, arise. Arise in your faith. If you can believe, all things are possible for you. Amen? Amen? Look to your scripture closely this morning. Do you see the words, if you can see it, or if you can buy it, in Mark chapter 9, verse 23? I don't see those words. If you can see it, then it's possible. If you can buy it, 
it's possible. I don't see those words. What I see is, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Amen? God didn't say if you can buy it. Some people are poor. Huh? God said, if you can believe. We all can believe, right? You can be blind and believe. You can be poor and believe. Jesus said, all things are possible to the one who believes. Can you believe this morning? Amen. If you can believe, then all things are possible. We spoke on Mark chapter 11, verse 24, these past two weeks, where Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. You remember that? If you're praying, seeking God, and expecting to receive from him, are you praying his will, his word within your needs? You see, that's the key. Pray God's will according to your needs, and you will have what you ask. You believe in what God has promised you throughout his whole word, the Bible? You remember what we've learned these past few weeks. God will answer your prayers, but that doesn't mean that he'll all just give you whatever you ask for. Amen? Remember that? Amen. God knows what is best for us. He will answer our prayers in his way, in his time, and therefore we need to ask for things that are in harmony to his will. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things. And every man, every man is a liar, but let God be true. Amen? Amen. Let God be true and every man a liar. God may say yes <laughs> to your request. He may say no, or he may say wait. But there is no prayer that you have asked that has never been unanswered. Amen? Amen. I want to say, see a show of hands. How many claim to be a child of God? You're a son and a daughter of God. Amen? Amen. So what father, having a child that is hungry, shall give unto him not a piece of bread or a piece of meat, but a scorpion. No father who loves his child will do that, right? right. Your heavenly father knows what you have need of, even before you ask. Amen. How much more does he love you than a natural father? Amen. God will give you what you ask, what you need. Amen? Mm -hmm. Only believe. Yeah. Only believe. Pray and watch the God of possibilities work in your life. When you ask of God, your Father, for something that you have need of, He is there to meet your need. Amen? Amen. There is not a prayer that He will not answer, that He would not do for you, for your best interest, for His glory. Amen? Amen? What problem could you bring to God and He couldn't resolve? What sickness, what sadness, what trial, what struggle? The doctor may say, there's nothing more we can do. <clears throat> the Lord may say, we've done all that we can do. Man may say, this is beyond our means, beyond our knowledge, beyond our resources, beyond our ability. But with God, all things are possible. I need to hear it again from you. Yeah. All things are possible. I need to hear it again. All things are possible. Amen. With God. Amen. We all know people who have made promises. And even some who have made promises that we knew weren't even possible for them to keep. But we know that they make promises, don't we? But God says there is not one promise that he has not kept in his word. Remember, let God be true, every man alive. If God had promised it, my wife says it a lot. She hasn't said it in a few weeks, but I've heard her say it so many times throughout our 30 plus years of marriage. April 6th of Mark, that's 31 marriage? 30. Wow. Eight. Ouch! <laughs> I lost seven years along the way. 38 years, March 6th. And I've heard her say it throughout April. those 38 years that God has said, April 6th, that God has said, I don't know why I said March. My date on the paper. All right, so God said, <laughs> through my wife many times, she has said, if God promised it, God will do it. If God promised it, God will fulfill it. Amen? Amen? And how true that is. Let me read for you a couple scriptures where God says, if I promised it, I will fulfill it. 
Romans chapter 13, he promises that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? Can you agree with that? Look around you. We sang the song, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Look at your life. Amen. See what God has done. Amen. There is not a promise in his word that he has not kept. All those who call upon in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone who has asked Jesus to save them, God has fulfilled. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Philippians 4 19. But my God shall supply all your need. I underline all your need. According to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. There are hundreds and hundreds of promises that God has made to you and I, and I found throughout the Word of God that they were yes and amen. 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 Yeah. First Kings chapter 8, verse 56 reads, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he has promised, there has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. Amen. And 1 Kings 8, 59 basically tells us that whoever, whatever we may require for any day, the abundance of grace that we need is provided for us. But you must look up for it. You must learn how to adapt to God's word and not your way of thinking. What do I mean by that? We have a tendency to say, yes, God will do it. But when we really have the need come to us, well, will God do it? Is God able to do it? Will God do it for me? He may do it for Pastor Ed. He may do it for Pastor Bob, but will he do it for me? You see? How many of you know that God is no respecter of persons? Hello? Amen. If God did it for me, he'll do it for you. Amen? I believe within my heart that you cannot receive unless your heart is perfect with God. Amen? How do you be perfect with God? It's simple. You must love him. That's it. Love him. As a father loves his child, as a child loves his father, that's all God requires of you. Everything else falls into place. Your love for God is what will gain God's attention. Your love for God compels him to spill over his blessings upon you because his love for you is greater than any love you could ever have for him, ever have for one another. His love is without measure. His love has no boundaries. Amen? Now, people say, well, I can't receive the blessings of God. I'm a sinner. Well, hello. We were all a sinner in some way, form, or fashion, right? Amen. But salvation came to the sinner, not to the righteous. Amen. Amen? Amen? It is the blood of Christ that causes you to be lovable. It is the blood of Christ that causes you to be forgivable. It is the blood of Christ that causes you to be free from the curse of sin. It is the blood of Christ that causes you to come into oneness in a relationship with Jesus. Not any righteous thing that you have done. Have you forgotten the last three weeks that we've been preaching on this? See, God's love for you goes beyond measure. It has no boundaries. You simply say, Lord, I love you. Please forgive me of my sin. And there's nothing that shall separate you from the love of God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Amen means I heard it, I believe it, so be it. Say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, you need to understand how we can be perfect with God is simply loving on him. And if you love on God, then we will obey him. You see, love doesn't come out of a, 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 a pressing a, authority, a thumb held over on your life. It doesn't come in obedience that way. Loving for God, you automatically, you, you internally want to be pleasing unto your Father. Amen. Amen. Amen? How many of us as children really wanted our dads to be mad? Huh? Our mamas to be upset with us? How many have ever wanted us not to be blessed by our families, our love from our dad and our mom? Nobody, right? We all wanted a love of our parents as they have loved us. Amen. So as you love the Father and the Father loves you, then you're willingly wanting to make him happy. Willingly loving him is causing you to be obedient. Amen? Amen. 
And in your obedience comes the blessing of the Father, poured out upon you without measure. Somebody say amen. 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 You see, as we shared last Sunday, our salvation, our relationship with God is not made possible by our own good deeds, our amen. own good works. Scripture teaches us that if we love God, we will obey him. Amen. amen. If you go to your Bible, you'll find in John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17. I want you to read it with me so that you can see it's not my words, but God's words. John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17. I'll give you a second to get there. Seconds up. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17. See, Jesus said that if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. Oh, I want to hear that again. He may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him nor know him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he shall be in you. Amen? Amen. So you see, while God calls upon us to honor him in obedience, it's not our good deeds that bring us into God's goodness toward us, but our obedience draws God closer to us as we show our love and affection for him, our adoration for him. Amen? Amen. Remember when we spoke on Moses' desire to draw close to God? That he wanted to see God face to face? How did God answer Moses? He said, Moses, you asked of me a hard thing because no man has seen my face. But God says, stand in the cleft of the rock and you shall see my backside, but my face must not be seen. You remember that story? God and Moses had a close relationship. They were in harmony with each other, just as close friends are. God and Moses were not literally face to face, but their relationship, their communication was very much like two people who spoke to one another as close friends would. Amen? Amen. God's very present consumes, rids, destroys sin. His holiness will not permit sin to remain. And in his truth, that we may be able to understand why it is, his truth is what is protecting us from the curse of sin. His truth, not our truth. Not what we call righteous. Amen? Amen? But his truth is love. And love disciplines those whom he loves. Amen? Amen? So sin is not something that God will tolerate. It's not something that God gives you a pass for. It's not something that God just glances at and says, well, you've got to fix that. It's, it, but it's okay. No, it's not okay. You see? Why does God hate sin so much? Anybody? Why does God hate sin so much? Separates us. Amen, sis. It separates you from God. Anything that would rob, kill, and destroy you from God's presence, his love for you, God hates. You see? People often feel that they can't come to church because there's a the house would cave in, the roof would cave in on them. Because I have to clean up my act first. I have to get rid of what I'm doing in my life. I can't do this, I can't do the other, I can't get away with this, I can't do... Yes, it's true that you must cast off the sinful thing that separates you from God. But how are you going to do that if you don't know this God that loves you so much? Amen. You can't know him unless someone tells you of him. You can't know him unless he speaks to your heart. You can't know him until you come into a relationship with him. Amen. So it's not about getting yourself cleaned up. Because in yourself, you cannot clean yourself up. Amen. Amen. Your God is the God of possibilities. Amen. It is not impossible to come into a relationship with Jesus in a bondsmanship like Moses had with Jesus. Jesus, God the Father, has shown himself to Moses, and he went beyond the measure that he expected, and he said, wow, Moses did. Wow, I'm really going to see this God that I've heard of from you, that I've learned of from you, that I have experienced in all the fashions, but I have yet not seen him with my own eyes. But God loves me so much that he's going to do the impossible. Uh -huh. God loves me so much that he is making it possible where there was no way. He's going to show himself to me. He's going to show himself to me. Somebody say it. He's going to show himself to me. 
God is the God of possibilities. Amen. Your sin is the only thing that will hold God's presence from your life. You see? And that is because his holiness, his goodness, would consume you. And that's not what God wants for you. God doesn't want you consumed in your sin. He doesn't want you destroyed in your sin. He doesn't want you lost in your sin. He doesn't want you separated in your sin. He wants you to draw closer. And as you're drawing closer, God draws closer to you. Amen? Amen. You see, it's the Spirit of God that rests upon the Christian that holds him, holds him accountable to God's law. Holds him accountable in love. I love you, therefore I obey you, God. Not because I have to, because I know the punishment's coming if I don't. See, there is a consequence to your sin. Punishment will come to those who reject Christ and reject his salvation. But it's not the object of his affection to hold a weight on you, to control you, and to dictate that you follow him and you follow his law. No, it is the love of God that compels you to follow God's law. Amen? amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. You see, God's very present consumes, rids, destroys sin. His holiness will not permit sin to live and remain in you, and therefore there has to be a cleansing. And the cleansing can only come through the blood of Christ Jesus. Not something that you can do on your own. You remember us talking about this the last few weeks? Amen. Somebody say, yeah, I remember. Amen. If you don't, we'll have to do that all over again. <laughs> God's very presence in your life is what God desires of you most. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. God's very presence in your life is what desire, what God desires the most. Mm -hmm. God's possible is not earned. God's possible is not bought. God's possible is a gift. Yeah. Oh, did you hear that, church? Yeah. Let's look to our lead scripture once again in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Matthew 19, 26, our lead scripture. Again, it says, But Jesus beheld them, and he said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. How often have we said or have heard the words, That's impossible? Huh? <laughs> As we have shared, scripture is filled with factual accounts of the impossible becoming possible. The Israelites, they left Egypt, not of their own strength of will, for they were captured and they were enslaved by the will of a God of possibilities. They were free, you see. They were trapped between the Egyptian army and the Red Sea. They looked as though it's not possible to stay alive. Somebody say, but God. <laughs> but God made a way where there seems to be no way. God parted the Red Sea, held it in place, and the people of God walked on dry ground. And when every last person who walked across the dry water bed of that sea crossed into safely, God collapsed the wall of water over their enemy, and the people of God were truly free. We serve a God of possibility. Amen. And I can only imagine the look on all the people's faces, both the Egyptians and the Israelites. <laughs> and I can almost hear the whisper, that was impossible. <laughs> that was impossible. <laughs> As they saw the water rise, and the ground dropped. And when the water fell, it swallowed up the enemy. God is the God of possibilities. Amen. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. It reads, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Hello? For with God, nothing shall be impossible. God's possible is not earned, but it's a gift. Amen? Remember what I shared with you a couple weeks ago? Always read scripture in its proper context. Never draw a conclusion by reading one verse. Get into it. Study whatever it is actually being said and learn from it. So what does Matthew 19.16 really end up saying in our scripture this morning? And looking all the way through verse 26. Let me read it to you. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he, meaning Jesus, said unto him, Why call me good? There is none good but one, that is God. For if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, Which commandment, Jesus? And Jesus said, Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, 
Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up. What am I lacking? Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect, go and sell what you have. Give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard the this saying, he went away sorrowful. Somebody said sorrowful. Sorrowful. This young man, when he heard what Jesus had said, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, which means very important, very, very important, I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them, said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen? Amen. When I read verse 16, I noticed that this rich man centers everything around himself, for himself. He says, What should I do that I have eternal life? You see? What is it that I can do to gain life eternal? In verse 17, Jesus answers this man's question with what he expected to hear from his youth. He said, to inter receive eternal life, keep the commandments. The young man expected that answer, you see. This rich man, he was trying to earn his salvation. And this man thought and then said, well, which ones? I got the impression that this dude was about to enter into a bargaining war with Jesus. Which ones? This one? That one? Maybe if I fulfill four of them. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> How many, Jesus? Four? Maybe five? Maybe he was thinking, wow, all ten? That's too many. <laughs> Who can keep all those? Right. Jesus quickly turns the man from the man, and he's thinking of himself and thinking of others, and Jesus says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Huh? Jesus was teaching that we need to learn to love our neighbors as we love ourselves because we can only do so by loving God first. You see? It goes about a realm of your father's love. Again, love your neighbor as you love yourself because then you'll know that you're loving your father. Huh? At first glance, we would think that this rich man wanted to do something good. Impossible. Because he did not even recognize the one who was good standing in front of him. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see? <laughs> Regret regrettably, too many have given way to this kind of thinking. That somehow by being a good person, doing good, or plan to do better for good, next time the opportunity arises, will make God good and lovable. Because he's bending my way. You ever hear that? I have a brother that says all the time, he says, I'm not afraid to go to hell. You know why I'm not afraid to go to hell? I said, you should be, but I'm not. Why? Because when I get down there, I'm going to rule hell. The devil don't want me down there because he knows I'm going to take over. Do you truly know what you're saying? Do you know the scriptures? Do you know what hell is? I think not. You see? You can't make God love you. And you can't decide what is going to happen to you. You are but a blade of grass here today and gone tomorrow. Amen. God has given you a purpose, a plan, and a future. Amen. But if you choose to live your own purpose, your own plan, your own future, right. Pastor Ed always said it, still says it today. You go on your own, you're on your own. <laughs> you have no God with you, but yourself, you claim yourself as God. Read the scriptures, how many proclaim to be God, and see the results. Only one God, Jehovah. He is the God of heaven and earth. He is the God of life. He's even the ruler of death. Amen? Amen. God will not make you love him. God will not make you obey him. But God will show his love for you that you may want to. Some said, I'll get there by the skin of my teeth. If I but just do the right thing. Hello? 
There's none righteous, not one, save Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God is the God of possibility. Why is it impossible to get to heaven by doing good things? Because our very thoughts, our words, and all our actions are stained with sin. That's why. That's why even Moses couldn't see God's face. A man that was so close to God, as our Bible tells us, could not even do what you were thinking of doing. Can you honestly tell me that you are not infected with a sinful thought every day? Hello? I can't tell you I'm a pastor and I'm telling you I have to ward off evil thoughts every day. There's no one who does good, not one. All of us have become something unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like a filthy cloth. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6 through 7 in your Bible, it says, But as we all, as an unclean thing, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calls upon your name, O God, that stirs up himself to take hold of you. For you have hid your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. You see? When I thought that I used to think the same thing, that all the good I've done outweighs the bad, <laughs> and those will save me and get me into heaven because the good outweighs the bad? Wow. How many will be lost and suffer the reality that our good will not save us? How sad for those who believe that they can make the impossible possible. Amen. Those of us who do not understand God's grace struggle with God's word as law. They struggle because instead of actually understanding that we don't deserve God's love, but it's by his grace that is given to us as a gift. They struggle in that truth, and they lose the truth and the reality of it, and they fall into the sinful thought that I can bend God's will to meet my will. Wow. I used to think that. I'll do good, I'll behave myself, and I'll have God's love. <laughs> you see, I was trying to follow the law of God, the Ten Commandments, just like the rich man said. How many must I fulfill to get heaven? How many must I do right, God? <laughs> Under the law of God's word, they struggled to do the more, try harder. That is what is known as the pure law. The law requires an obedience under the consequence of judgment. You see? Under the consequence of punishment. Not under grace that says, I love you, God, therefore I don't want to lose relationship with you. Not, I love you, God, because I don't want to lose having a love relationship with you. You see? I don't want you angry with me, God. I don't want your back turned toward me, God. I want to have relationship. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By the law is the knowledge of sin. I understand this to say that without the gospel, you and I are not motivated to do, to do anything right for God. Huh? And for this reason, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. For though the law we become aware of sin, yet it's impossible to please God simply by living under the law. Therefore, it's impossible for anyone to earn their way into heaven. Somebody say amen. It's Friday amen. here. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, verse 20, if you will. Matthew chapter 16, verse 20. Back to the young rich man. What does he say? Matthew 16, 20. He says, I have kept all these. What am I lacking? Huh? Again, this dude brings up his own importance, and Jesus addresses his heart. You remember what the heart represents in your body? Scientifically, biologically, nurse? What does your heart represent in your body? Without your heart, should it stop beating, producing blood flow within your body, what happens? You collapse, you die. Amen? Because of our heart produces and causes the nutrients and oxygen within our blood, which also causes it to flow throughout the rest of our body, it gives our body life. Metaphorically speaking, our heart is representing the central wisdom of feeling as opposed to head wisdom. Our heart is considered the command center of the soul. Our entire emotional nature and understanding flows from our heart. Jesus addresses the heart 
of man. Jesus said, in this man's heart lies wickedness of thought. In this man's heart, he doesn't grasp the knowledge of the truth that I'm trying to tell him. That none of your riches will save you. It is the heart turned toward the love of your father that will save you. Go and sell all that you have, rich man. Then I shall truly know your heart is for God. For God says, love thy neighbor as thyself. In loving your neighbor as yourself, you're demonstrating that you have the power to love. And only God can give you the power of true love. Amen. You see? He's addressing his heart. Your emotional understanding, your nature, all that makes up who you are, rest in the flow of your heart. What's the Bible say? Out of the heart flow the issues of life. What does Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 say about our heart? Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord God, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Huh? Yeah. Matthew 16, 20. I have kept all these. What am I lacking? Jesus addresses the motives within this man's heart as he does with all of our hearts. Jesus tells this rich young man to go sell everything that he has and give it to the poor. And Jesus even explains the possibilities that come from obeying him. Then, he says, you will have treasures in heaven, treasures that moth nor rust can destroy. Huh? But what must this young man do next? After selling all his riches and giving to the poor, what is it that he must do next? What Jesus said, come and follow me. Jesus wanted this young man to count the cost of following him. Huh? I've been under a couple fire and brimstone messages in my day. And you know what those are, right? Fire and brimstone messages. Those messages will have the hair on the back of your neck standing up, your knees shaking in your seat, and so much when the altar is called, you're almost afraid to go up there. <laughs> you're afraid heaven is going to release fire down upon you. Huh? You ever hear those kind of messages in church? I haven't heard one for a while, but I've heard of you. You see, fire and brimstone messages are fire messages which show the truth and reality of heaven and hell. The cost of not following Jesus, the consequences of sin. A reality wake-up call for the lost, the unsaved. Yeah. Usually filled with loud and vivid examples of judgment day. That's fire and brimstone messages. <laughs> I admit it's a great way to get people's attention. It's also a means to get us to see clearly that we are choosing for ourselves heaven and hell. Yeah. And we're either going to live for God or we're going to die for the devil. Counting the cost of following Jesus is knowing that self-sacrifices will be required. You see that? Yeah. Jesus was saying to this young man, self-sacrifices will be required for you to follow me. Huh? Yeah. Go and sell what you have and follow me. I have a question for you. If I told you that I'm going off and traveling the world, and you decided that you wanted to come with me, what is it that you would hope to pack? in your back and bring with you. Huh? Yeah. The young man had too many worldly possessions to give them up. You see? And he had to give them away. He couldn't sell them. He didn't gain life and he didn't gain a prosperous lifestyle by selling them and remaining in the profits of his sellings. His sales. He couldn't bring himself to sacrifice them. His self-trust made eternity impossible. Oh, did you hear that church? Self-trust made an eternity impossible. You see, looking to do more and more and more did not satisfy his life and it could not save him. Our nation is abundantly blessed. Would you say that? Yes. I would. As I look across our nation, even though we've been hit hard this last few years, we're still abundantly rich. Hello? Amen. Because here in America, most people have enough to live comfortable lives. I do. 
view. I'll never forget my first eyesight in Haiti, what my eyes fell upon as I'm going through the villages to get to where I need to be in the Port-au-Prince. Port-au-Prince is the capital of Haiti. I'll never forget the sights I saw. People were actually living like you would see on TV. We often look on TV as they're showing the, the poor and the, the sheltered and the, the de devastating islands where they've been tor hit with tornadoes and earthquakes and diverse kind of strange happenings that cause their lifestyle to be uprooted. Buildings collapse. In that time frame, before they could get themselves together, they were living in makeshift houses. In Haiti, they, it's not a one-time thing. Outside of the Port-au-Prince, the capital, are villages made of scrap metal and wood, whatever they could find, a little hut for their family. Yeah. Whatever they could find. Many are living in the streets. Yeah. Many are begging for food along your way. Yeah. They see an American and they say, he is a millionaire. He is rich. And they flock for him, hoping that he could give him a little something. And they expect it free because you have so much. Yeah. America is abundant in so many ways. Yeah. Richly, richly blessed. Now, when you ask God for things, I never said that you're going to get what you want, did I? According to the scriptures, you shall have your needs met. That's what I read. How about that? Did you hear that this morning? Yeah, your needs will be met. Majority have a roof over our head. Majority have food on our table. Running water from the sink, etc. Mm -hmm. Some would say that we even have more than enough. We have more than enough. And Satan knows we're blessed. And it comes to no surprise that the devil tries to distract us from the treasures of heaven because we are so blessed. Mm -hmm. You see? The rich man could not let his worldly possessions go because he is so rich and blessed. Mm -hmm. And he may even look to himself and say, well, God, you're the one that blessed me. You're the one that gave me all these blessings. Why would you want me to give them up? Mm -hmm. Anybody ever think like that? Mm -hmm. God, you gave me this house. You're going to let the bank take it? <laughs> no, you don't let the bank take it. You didn't pay. <laughs> I gave you a job. And, and did you use your money wisely? Huh? Did you buy within your means or did you buy a house that goes excessively beyond your amount that you're blessed with? You see? People can distort God's truth to fit their needs and fit their desires far easier than they can align their word of God up with what God says you need of. Hello? Did you catch that? Amen. We are so easily entangled with the blessings of this life that we miss out on the real blessings of life. Oh, that's a truth that needs to be preached on. Hello? Amen. Jesus addresses the motives within this man's heart. And he does so with even our hearts. Jesus tells this young man to go and sell everything he has and give it to the poor. And Jesus even explains the possibilities of obeying him. What's he say again? You shall have treasures in heaven, but these treasures will not rust nor be destroyed by moth. Amen? Amen? What was Jesus telling us? In essence, Jesus told him to seek first the kingdom of God. Hello? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And what? All these things shall be added unto you. Amen? Mm -hmm. Jesus wanted this young man to count the cost of following him. Follow Jesus. Take up your cross and follow him. There are sacrifices that you have to meet, that you will run into. Not going to be pleasant, not going to be easy. <laughs> Some would say that our fleshly desires, they are simple to deal with. They can be shucked off and cast off. I don't know about that. I've had some fleshly desires that dictated who I am and what I am and what I wanted. Hello? It's called addiction to drugs and alcohol. Hello? Anybody been there? How about, yeah, you may not even been addicted to it, but you had a lust for it. I desired it. I, I, I can go all week without drinking. I can go months without drinking. But I desire it because it gives me a freedom that I've never experienced before. I never explored. Huh? Alcohol and drugs gets rid of your inhibition. Your inhibition is that self-discipline. The self-discipline that keeps you at bay from doing things that you normally wouldn't do. Hello? So some of us say, well, oh, I can get rid of that fleshly desire so easily. Not so much. Not in your own strength. 
God can give you a new desire. But my wife just told someone not long ago, I heard her say it on the phone. She says, you know, when God cleans the house, you have to fill it. And if you don't fill it, then something evil, ten times, seven times worse, is going to come in behind it and fulfill that house, fill up that house. What is it that you're filling your desires up if you cast your desires off the flesh? What is it now that you're filling your desires up with? I would hope the desires of God for your life. Amen. Amen. You see, this young rich man, he thought it's so simple to cast off his desire, his richness, his blessings. But it wasn't so easy for him. Because he realized that they didn't come easy and they're not going to go easy. You see? The ways of this world present such a hardship on life. But if you look at it on the other side of that coin, the hardships of life does not compare to the riches of God's glory. You see? But in his mind, he couldn't weigh that out. He couldn't see that God's goodness is so much greater than this badness, this stuff that's going to rust and, and corrupt and be gone. My life is gone if it was not for God's goodness. You see? He could not weigh it out and say, well, which one weighs more? Which one has more value? Which one means life to me? This means life to me. I can tangibly, I can feel this. <laughs> I can see this. I've experienced this. I live off of this. Jesus, what are you offering? Sell all that you have? It gives me nothing. <laughs> Give to the poor? You mean don't take any profit from it? Well, what am I going to live on? Huh? Jesus has him examine his heart. And he walked away saddened because his heart could not be fulfilled with the richness of God. Oh, my goodness. When I read that, you know, I told you how I study the Bible. I read it, and I don't just stick on one verse, one, one little couple paragraphs. I want to read the whole chapter to find out where this man's thinking is. Whoever's telling the story, whoever's telling, I, I hate the word story, I take that back. Whoever's telling the effect, the actual event of the situation, I want to be envisioning that. How many watch TV and get so caught up in the movie that you feel like you're part of that movie? I can tell you if you can feel if you're a part of that movie. When you're watching a scary movie, do you jump? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Does your heart race a little bit? Do you catch your breath a little bit? Then you're in the movie, you see? That's how I read the word. I, get, I, I cannot read the Bible in front of my wife. There's noise in the background. There's this, that going on. She'll ask me a question. I have to get by myself, and I have to get into this thing all by myself, and I have to be there with God because I want to feel what I'm reading. How many of you? You see? You can do it for watching a football game. You can do it going to the, the theater and watching a play. You can do it in a concert, and you're into it. You can feel it. Your heart is beating. You're into it. I get that way with the Word of God, but I can only get that way with me and Him. Somebody else is around, I get distracted, and I can't really focus the way I normally do. So I was thinking about this young rich man, and I was picturing that I was one of the disciples standing back and watching and listening to this conversation. And Jesus, in my mind, was watching this sad Christian man, or excuse me, sad rich man, walk away from him. I can imagine the heart of Jesus <coughs> watching this man walk away, not truly knowing, this rich man, not truly knowing and understanding what he's walking away from. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. He's walking very sad, the Bible says. He walked away. So, think about it. If he truly knew who was talking to him, yeah. if he truly understood the Son of God, Amen. the salvation, the meaning of the whole salvation is standing in front of you, and it's he that's offering you life. Would he have turned his back and walked away sad? No. You know why he walked away sad? First of all, let's talk about why he walked away. He walked away not knowing and believing the truth. If you can believe, all things are possible. He could not believe that life was speaking to him. He could not believe salvation was extending his hand to him. He could not believe that Jesus, the Son of God, is the Son of God. And he walked away sad in his own possibility of losing what he has gained in his life. What is it that you're asking God for today? Is it possible that your possibility has become your impossibility? 
that treasure that you hold into, that hope that you hold into. Listen, I was talking to somebody, and I wasn't playing on this, but I'm going to tell you because the Lord put in my spirit. I was talking to somebody this week and said, I am so sad. She was happy in a minute. I mean, laughing, talking, enjoying the conversation. And all of a sudden, she had tears in her face, and she started crying. I said, what are you crying for? You were happy just two minutes ago. Because I don't have a husband. And why have I been praying for years, and I don't have a husband? Why won't God give me a husband? And I asked her, where does your love rest? Where does your love rest? She couldn't understand my question. What do you mean love rest? Where does love rest? When you're resting in God, you know that his love is for you, so he has your best interest at heart. Maybe the guy that you're praying for is not there. Maybe the guy that you're praying for, you have an image, you have a likeness of what this guy should be, and you're asking God with that attitude in your heart, God, give me that husband. You see? You plan the way. You plan the how. You plan where he's coming from. You plan what he's supposed to look like. You made description to God for what you wanted in your heart. You may not have said it with your mouth, but how many of you know that God knows the intent of your heart? God knows all thoughts. He knows Amen. what's in your heart. Amen. Huh? Some of you don't have your husband and wife because you told God how they're supposed to look, how they're supposed to act, and where they're supposed to come from, and which one is supposed to be. Hello? You serve a God of possibilities. You're serving you're looking for the impossibility. God has your best interest at heart. It is the husband that he designs for you that will come your way. Amen. It's the husband that he has made for you that will come your way. It's the woman that he has made for you that will come your way. I always, always, God will not let me release this. He has always told me from the jump that Adam waited on God, not knowing his woman was even in the picture. He did not have a vision of what this woman was supposed to be. He did not have an idea of what she was supposed to look like. He didn't even know she existed. He knew there was an emptiness. I believe there was an emptiness. And God looked in the man's heart and he said, it is not good that man live alone. I will make a helpmate for him. God made the helpmate. Did you hear that? Amen. And then what happened? Adam went to sleep. Adam went to sleep. God put him to sleep and he took his rib and he formed woman from Adam. Have you caught what it says next? God brought the woman to Adam to see what he would call her. He didn't say Adam went on to look. There's something different here. I feel it. Not sure what it is. Something happened. I don't know what happened. I'm going to go find out. He didn't say that. He went about his life, enjoying the blessings of God, enjoying what God has given him. And in the, in, the, in the midterm of what he has been enjoying, God brought a woman to him. Some of us have our riches making it impossible for God's possible for your life. Did you hear that? Amen. Some of you are relying on your own idea and your own thinking of what the blessings of God is for your life. And you're losing the real possibility of the blessings. Somebody say amen. Amen. <laughs> We all know about paying for products and services, right? <laughs> In order to eat, we have to buy food. In order to watch television, we have to pay for the cable service, the internet. It's our way of life, amen? amen. We grumble and we complain about the rising cost, but we still pay it, don't we? Yeah. I believe that there are some people who try and buy their way into heaven. Yeah. But I know and hopefully you all know that that is impossible. Amen. But I know and hopefully Again, saying that you are not like this rich man, Amen. right? Because you know there's nothing on heaven and earth that God did not create, that does not belong to him. Amen. You put your faith and your hope and trust in him, that he supplies all your need. You see? Amen. That same rich man, he ended up having nothing in heaven. Nope. That man that Jesus raised from the dead, we spoke of earlier, his name is Lazarus. And he had nothing of early, earthly value, but he was rich toward God. He now has everything in heaven. How many of you know that we cannot pay for one single sin that we've ever committed? Amen. Hello? Amen. We cannot buy away our sin. We cannot buy a ticket to enter into eternity. Amen. Psalm 49, verse 69 says, Those who trust in their wealth and in their many riches boast themselves. A man cannot at all redeem a brother, nor give God a ransom for him. 
For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceases forever. For he shall live, yet live forever. He shall never see corruption. In short, it's impossible to save ourselves from ourselves. Uh, Amen. It's impossible for us to save our loved ones. We can't do that. And that's why I say that God's possible is God's gift unto us. Amen. In Matthew 23, the disciple of Jesus heard the conversation between Jesus and a rich young man. And I thought it interesting that Jesus immediately took the opportunity to teach from this young man's <coughs> excuse me, interaction. Jesus saw the heart of the rich man, and he really understood the difficulty that this young man was struggling with. On one hand, this young man must have been drawn by the Holy Spirit to even find himself interested to learn of this Jesus and to take him seriously at his word. So seriously that he wanted to hear the truth and be saved. But on the other hand, this young man, he had experienced the joys and the comforts of his wealth. And even though the popularity amongst the people, it, it was so great for him, he knew that there was something missing and he had to do more. But then his fleshly desires were not being met because, why? Because his heart was all in his wealth. Right. Amen. Okay. His fleshly desires were not even being met because he was brought from the truth. The fleshly wants to live. Remember what we talked about last Sunday? Self-preservation? Yes. You will do everything to preserve your life. If you walk up upon a rattlesnake, you're going to step out of its way. If you see an oncoming speeding car, you're going to avoid trying to be hit. Amen. Amen. Your self-instinct preserves your life. Your fleshly desire to live is strong. But how many of you know your scripture says the flesh is what? Willing? Right? No. The flesh is weak, but your spirit is willing. Your flesh is weak, but your spirit is willing. This rich man's spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. How about you? Can you imagine winning the multi-million dollar lottery? What freedoms, what joys, what comfort you gain? Not to mention all the family members that you never knew you had. <laughs> huh, John? <laughs> new friends, new experience. Life is taking a whole new angle for you. And with all this, you also realize that there is a God. And one day, your life will come to an end. And you know this because you've attended a funeral time or two. So then along the life of wealth and happiness, you meet up with this Jesus. And your inner spirit has been begging to know the answer that is deep-seated within your life all along. I'm missing something. I may have everything, but I'm missing something. What must I be, do to be saved? What must I do to enter into heaven? The disciples hear the words of Jesus, again I said. That this young rich man, he looks deep within his heart, and he turns his thoughts toward his wallet, and he sadly walks away. Jesus clearly tells the disciples. He tells us that you and I, we have a very hard time with our wealth of this life. And understanding that it is far outweighed the goodness of God in some people's lives. The richness of this wealth has far outweighed the goodness of God in some people's lives, in their heart. How sad that is. In verse 24, Jesus basically adds, it's so hard that it's impossible to come into the kingdom of God through the man's riches. A camel cannot go through the eye of a needle, can it? Then the disciples looked at Jesus and he asked, who then can be saved? In verse 26, scripture doesn't say that Jesus was looking at, but it does say Jesus looked at the disciples. You see, I pictured it, as I said, Jesus looking as this man walks away. And sadly, Jesus' response was saying, who can come into heaven because of his riches? And it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of an evil than it is for him to go through in the, in the kingdom of heaven. I can imagine Jesus' heart at the time, watching this man walk away. And then he hears the words, who can then be saved? And Jesus, his attention focused, turned from the sad rich man and spoke to his own. He said, last week I shared with you, when I studied the Bible, I looked into who's speaking kind of get the attitude, the heartbeat of the story, and I, I try to remember what Jesus is trying to teach us. Scripture implies here that Jesus beheld, or he looked at the disciples. You see, his attention went from the sad man, and he looked for the hopeful. He looked for the man who rejected him, and he looked for those who were willing to accept him. 
He turned from the sin and turned toward the righteous in Christ. And he spoke the truth to them, giving them life, a hope, a future. Jesus, the scripture implies again, that he turned from them and beheld, looked to his disciples. Jesus was studied upon that rich young man who was slowly walking away and very sad. This spoke to my heart. The heart of God weeps for those who cannot receive the truth, even the truth that would save their souls into eternity. And Jesus looked at the disciples, and as he spoke, I could imagine his full attention was toward them. And as if to say, hear these words, they're very important. With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. This statement says that, that, that we often say within ourselves, it's impossible. God cannot possibly meet my need in this thing. It's impossible that God raise my child up from the deathbed. It's impossible that God causes the blind to see. It's impossible to cause the lame to walk. It's impossible to cause the deaf to hear. It is impossible. The Bible of promise says your statement is a statement of unbelief. That impossible word is unbelief. If you haven't heard much of this morning's message, I need you to catch this in closing. The Lord God has made those things that are impossible, possible. You heard it at the beginning. You heard it through the rich man's very own words. I cannot attain life through you. I have life now, and I live in abundance now. I cannot give it all up and follow you. Where we once were born enemies of God, we are now friends, even children of God. Once impossible, now made possible. God has given man a faith to cling on to. And in this faith, we have become the children of God. Once impossible, now made possible. We once had a heart of stone. Holy Spirit changed our heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Once impossible, now made possible. Amen. We once owed a debt for our sins, which was a death sentence. Now the impossible was made possible. Our sins are forgiven freely and fully. Once impossible, now made possible. Our disobedience earns eternal judgment. Jesus' innocent suffering and blood loss. His precious blood shed paid the price for my sin. This was impossible, but now is made possible. I'll close with reading Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. If you stand to your feet, please. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9 says this. For by grace you are saved, through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works that anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before prepared that we should walk in them. Amen? Amen. You see, the impossible is possible. Amen. But the possible is lost to those who attach themselves to those things that will keep us from the God of possibilities. It is our own desires, our own fleshly lusts that leads us into temptation. And once temptation has had its way, it will produce what? Sin. And the wages of sin is death. You want your possible? Then seek God's righteousness. Live in it. Love God with all of your heart, your mind, and your strength. And your impossible will become possible. Amen? Amen. I say hold to God unchanging hands. In his hands are endless possibilities. Amen. Amen. Hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. Build your ropes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. I said, hold to his hands, God's unchanging hands. I said, hold to his hands, God's unchanging hands. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. Amen. You plan to do that? Yeah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Listen God to your word. We thank you, God, for writing that word upon our heart. We, we might find life in you, Father God, and walk away from the death spirit, Father, which aims to kill, seek, kill, and destroy. Rob us from your truth, God. We ask, Lord, that you put your word upon our heart and we walk in it. Not just hear it, but walk in it, God. Believe me that all things are possible to those who would believe. In Jesus' yeah. name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. We're going to the Plaza Mexican restaurant afterward. Afterward. After church.